Hey folks, and welcome back to the video lectures for Philosophy 114, Global Moral Issues, where we're going to look at the issue overview for the Unit 6 on money, corruption, and politics. All fun topics this time of the year. So this is the usual overview of the questions and ideas that we're going to be spending the next couple of lectures and readings looking at. In particular, this is not a vocab-heavy unit, so you know, cheers for that. But instead, we're going to take a little bit more time to focus on the questions that we'll look at, framing those and understanding just really what they mean for us by running through a couple of examples and looking at the couple of different unique issues that we're going to be looking at. Uh, so we'll spend a bit of time on the introduction, you know, sort of go over our you know, usual sort of thought experiment, scenario thing to illustrate things a little bit. We'll talk about free speech and money and how this sort of you know, topic gets tied all together with that. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about corruption and whether or not it's something that we should tolerate, morally speaking. And we'll also look at an interesting dilemma called the problem of dirty hands, where we wonder whether or not rulers must be corrupt and allow themselves and allow those who work for them to benefit a bit on the side just as a side effect of political realities. But to start off, I have a bit of a question for you. Fun little thing to consider for a brief time. Suppose that I had the power to make you, yes you, the ruler of the United States, not the president, not a congressman, not any sort of limited, you know, lesser leader that you might have heard of. The literal direct and unlimited ruler of the country that most of us at least currently live in. I wonder, what sort of ruler would you be if given the opportunity? If you had unlimited power, would you be a despot, a tyrant, someone who just benefits off the system and uses the power to enjoy themselves and accomplish whatever petty goals they may have? Or would you be benevolent? Perhaps you have some ideas on how you could actually fix all this mess. If you could just get into the driver's seat, there's all sorts of ways that you might could benefit people, that you might could improve things. And I imagine some of you would try and do it as honestly and morally uprightly as you possibly could, which is admirable, you know, especially considering that I'm your ethics instructor. I kind of have to say that. But it is. But I wonder how well you might actually be able to do that. How many of you instead might choose the path of the tyrant? And it's especially worth asking when we start moving away from this pleasant sort of fantasy where I can imagine you or you can imagine yourself as the unlimited fantasy ruler of the country that we live in. Because as soon as we start adding any degree of reality to this sort of scenario, we start having to deal with all of the corrupt, selfish, and unfortunately necessary advisors, viziers, politicians, all the underlings who actually run many of the day-to-day -day elements of a nation. I wonder, if once introduced to these elements, if your choice has to change somewhat, if those of you who still wanted to be the benevolent ruler, could you still be in the face of those who ask for kickbacks in exchange for supporting that one bill that you need passed, or perhaps uh, the support of a key ally. You have to sweeten the pot a little bit in order to make sure that it actually happens. How long would you be able to maintain that honest and upright position that you wanted to start yourself in, or you wanted to occupy throughout your reign? So these sort of political realities that complicate things for rulers and leaders of all sorts. And it's something that's worth considering at least a little bit. But even on the other side of the throne, we have to wonder about how direct and how upright we can actually be all of the time. Because for all the, that we as citizens sort of decry corruption and that we worry about, oh, well, you know, if only we could get rid of all this mess and just handle things simply and honestly, 
it seems as though sometimes we need some of those layers of corruption and whatever else that we almost have to tolerate it or even make use of it in many cases. Because if you imagine yourself on the other side of the ruling table, then you imagine that you're simply a citizen who needs to approach the ruler with some sort of problem or issue that you need taken care of or that you need to bring to the ruler's attention. Oftentimes, it's virtually impossible to do this sort of thing. Rulers, after all, have a lot going on. They have many different concerns and many different citizens to worry about, with many different special interest groups all clamoring for their attention. So if instead someone offers to represent you to the ruler, that is, they know how to bring your issues and your concerns to their attention and make sure that they actually get taken care of, but in return, they need to be cared for themselves in certain ways. Would you or should you actually take advantage of such an offer? Is it necessary for you to, if you might otherwise be ignored and desperate needs be unfulfilled along the process? These are the kinds of things that come up when we start discussing the general idea and the general issue of corruption and money and politics and how these three sorts of things all tie together in this worldwide phenomenon that we can just generally discuss as corruption. Now, by corruption, uh, we'll be mostly using some version of the legal definition of this, where we talk about uh, the act of some official or leader uh, basically misusing their station, position, or reputation to benefit themselves or their allies uh, in ways that are not quite upright or in line with their duties and obligations. So a corrupt person or corruption might involve a leader misusing his power for personal gain or benefiting others or allowing others to benefit through their actions in ways that aren't supposed to happen. And this sort of thing it seems particularly relevant as we move through yet another political season here in the United States. Uh, November is election month every couple of years. Whether it be the presidential elections or the midterm elections, they still remain very important uh, time periods where thoughts about money in politics, politicians, who's corrupt, who's not, and what we morally ought to accept as citizens and participants in the political sphere, what we ought to tolerate, what we ought to deal with, how should we respond to some of these issues and topics. And it's not just a U.S. thing. Corruption is unfortunately a global phenomenon, both within politics and in business, everything down to charity. Uh, I believe one of the links I've stuck up on Blackboard talks about uh, charities that misuse their positions and their funds in various ways. So corruption as a whole, even though we may talk about it in terms of the U.S. system, since most of us are either U.S. citizens or residents, it really is a global moral issue that affects countless systems, governments, and areas just around the planet. And probably this is not news to you. I'm not discussing some new topic or issue that you're unfamiliar with. In fact, depending on where you grew up, you may be very familiar with this sort of thing. But I think the interesting moral issues that come from this sort of thing is whether what we normally call corruption is ever morally justified, or perhaps even required, morally speaking, in some instances. See, the word itself is sort of biased in the same way that murder is. Murder, by definition, is a wrongful killing. Corruption, similarly, has built directly into the definition that it involves misusing resources or one's position for the benefit of oneself or others. So on its face, what we normally call corruption is sort of automatically immoral or impermissible. But if we simply think about the actions involved with it, and we try and avoid the question-begging definition just some of the time, or perhaps try and distance ourselves from it, we get some interesting moral questions of whether or not we ought to tolerate a certain amount of corruption, of whether or not it might be necessary 
or whether we ought to reject that sort of idea and you know, try and remove corruption as much as possible from the systems that we have to engage with. Uh, consider this, for example, just to illustrate some of what I'm talking about. In 2010, the United States Supreme Court uh, changed the landscape on how money and politics relate to each other with the court decision Federal Elections Commission versus Citizens United. This is a Supreme Court case, you know, and thus the law of the land, that gets a lot of discussion these days, especially when elections roll around. See, this is the case that made it legal for corporations, that is, you know, businesses that have been incorporated under the law, for corporations to be able to make unlimited financial contributions to groups called political action committees or PACs including the infamous super PAC, an alternate formulation of the same thing that doesn't have to disclose its donors. Now, this court case removed restrictions that had previously been there. Uh, you and I, private citizens, have a limit on how much money we can donate to a particular candidate under the law. And similarly, corporations have the same. However, uh, these sorts of limitations were removed with Citizens United. And the court essentially argued that based on previous decisions, the general position of the court has been always to protect free speech as much as possible, except for a few particular cases of things like shouting fire in a crowded theater or yelling death threats at somebody. Aside from a few specific sorts of instances, the courts always ruled to protect free speech, no matter where it comes from. And insofar as corporations are capable of participating in elections, and participating of making their positions heard, in a sense, um, you know, not that corporations necessarily have positions or opinions, they're not people that think in that way, but they can have interests that can be represented in a certain way. And so, uh, however speech is made, the court ruled that it ought to be protected. Speech should be protected no matter its source, they said. And so restricting speech because it comes from a corporation rather than a natural person, you know, that is an ordinary flesh and blood human being, was an unjustified restriction, they said. And so in 2010, they removed those and made it so that corporations in certain circumstances could make unlimited financial contributions because they represented large numbers of people and had large amounts of resources and so on and so forth. Now, just as a side note, this court case did not make it the case that corporations are people. That's a much older idea that's been around as long as contracts have pretty much in the Western Hemisphere. It's kind of a necessary fiction that we use to make contracts and other things make sense. But this court case is still particularly important because now that there are fewer limitations on how much money can be thrown around during an election, all of a sudden candidates start appealing differently to different candidates and they start listening to different interest groups differently. Uh, it seems far more important that a politician uh, essentially listen to the interests of those that can keep them in power and that can keep funding their re-election campaigns and keep making donations to the places that they need donations made and so on. And so all of a sudden, corporate interests became far more important than they previously had been because now corporations could make larger donations, could make unlimited donations under the right circumstances. So... Uh, this sort of court case now make, makes it the fact that there is more money being thrown around in elections. And that means that there is now a very obvious corrupting influence that is far stronger than it used to be. And if you really don't believe me that this sort of thing is far bigger than it once was, just Google, just take a few moments to look up first who your local or state representatives are at the federal level. Because I guarantee most of you do not know who your House of Representative res, uh, representatives are or who your congressmen are, so on. And that's you know, par for the course. It's pretty average for the United States these days. But after figuring out who they are, 
see if you can find out how much they've had donated to how much they've had donated to them by various large companies and then maybe compare that against their voting records which are public record you can look up and see how did they vote on this issue or that issue on this law or that law and see if it perhaps might have changed things just a little bit and all of this is now possible because the court was trying to do something far more admirable. That is, it was trying to protect the freedom of speech by protecting speech wherever it comes from. And so as a result, as an perhaps unintended result, the Supreme Court now makes it far more possible for politicians to be corrupt or to be more corrupt than they were, I guess is perhaps the better way of putting it. More beholden to special interests and more self-serving in a very questionable sort of way. And so we can morally raise the issue, raise the question of whether or not this whole situation is morally permissible. Is this something that is all right to allow? Or knowing full well that this sort of thing can happen, should the decision have been different? Should we as citizens, as participants in the political process, should we not tolerate this sort of situation? Is this something that's morally reprehensible in some sense? And in a way, it's not totally unlike trolley problems, where we can see that an action that's going on has two possible effects, one good and one bad, and we have to decide whether or not it's morally permissible to take this action, to throw the switch and kill one to save five, or whether we have to stand back and not do something that seems otherwise necessary. And so there's a few interesting moral arguments that can be made on either side of this sort of issue. Some are simple consequentialist arguments that can be made for both sorts of answers. Uh, we might could look at arguments to say that, yes, it is morally permissible to allow this sort of corruption because it's necessary to produce the greater good of just protecting free speech. Or we might look at the longer term consequences and say that, no, the amount of issues that corruption and money in politics cause far outweigh the benefits of protecting free speech. These are things that we can look at a little bit on either side. But I think another interesting, and for the sake of teaching the course, uh, far more novel concept is look at the non-consequentialist standpoint. Look not just to the results of the action, but to these other features of the action. In particular, we can look at a concept called the doctrine of double effect, which is essentially a principle that tries to give an explanation for when an act with two different effects, one good and one bad, might be morally permissible or not. And this is something that we'll spend a, f a fair bit more time on in the next lecture. Uh, this is a concept that when applied to issues like money and politics, can give some very interesting points and things to consider, things to look at as to whether or not we as citizens ought to treat this as being acceptable. We can also approach this, uh, this general topic from a different direction. We might wonder whether or not leaders and politicians must be corrupt uh, when we start looking at something called the problem of dirty hands, which is essentially the somewhat paradoxical idea it's actually necessary for a ruler or a leader, whether they be democratic or not, to actually be corrupt to a certain degree, or at least okay with corruption, in order to accomplish the things they want to accomplish, and in order to prevent great wrongs, to produce great goods, and in general, simply stay in power. This sort of problem really is a problem when we start framing it as is it necessary, is it right for a leader to do something morally wrong? Is it actually required of them to a certain degree? If it is, then we have this odd sort of paradox of it being right to do something wrong. And making sense of this is a rather interesting philosophical challenge. It's something that's very much worth thinking about and highlights, I think, a perspective that's not often taken when discussing issues of money and corruption and power and all these sorts of things.
Now, we won't dig into all the political science of all this, and we won't dig into every aspect of this topic. We could do an entire course simply on problems related to this sort of subject in general. But instead, our focus is going to be on those main two types of questions, and we'll look at each of those in more depth in the coming lectures. Next time in particular, we're going to start looking at the moral arguments around money and politics, and the doctrine of double effect is our biggest focus. Uh, because again, it highlights a way of thinking about moral problems, in particular about things like this subject that we haven't quite done yet. We've looked at some consequentialist reasoning before, in particular with uh, things like inequality and charity and even animal rights. We've not done a whole lot of non-consequentialist examinations of things yet. I think it's high time that we did so. Once we look at the doctrine of double effect, however, we'll start tackling the question of whether or not politics and, you know, requires some degree of corruption. So we'll look at the problem of dirty hands and sort of discuss the supposed realities of power and leadership. So make sure and take a look at the readings. There's a couple of videos in addition to the readings this time. We're not doing the textbook at all this unit. Instead, it's going to be things that are just posted here on Blackboard or linked to elsewhere on the web. So make sure you don't ignore those. They are useful for some of our discussions. Until next time, though,